Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. Well, I want to welcome the uh, viewing audience of the Manifest Telecast, and we are in on what's called the Hulda Steps, uh, which is in, in the uh, southern section of the city of Jerusalem, right outside the wall, the old wall of the city. And we have a large number of people here on our second tour. For quite some time, I have wanted to preach a message here. And every time I return back to the United States, I think, wow, I didn't get that message out. And I, I, and I come back the next year. And so we intended on our partners tour to move into this special mystery that a lot of people don't know happened. And so I thought, I actually forgot my notes on the bus. And I thought, you know what? Let me see if I can go from memory and preach this message. There are a lot of people who do not realize that this happened immediately after the crucifixion of Jesus. And this deals with the mystery of the three days and nights when Jesus' body was in the tomb. Now, before I talk about what he did, I have to talk about what happens at death. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says that we are a body, we are a soul, and we are a spirit. We're a tripart being, okay? And being a tripart being, something happens to us at the time of death. And that is that the soul and spirit separates out of the body. Now, I have a lot of friends. They're very good Christian people that believe in something called soul sleep. And that is that the soul and spirit sleep inside the body at the place of death. If it's buried in a coffin, the soul and spirit's in the coffin. If a person was a naval officer and they died in a submarine, the spirit and soul is there in the ocean. And, and one of the verses used for that is that the sea gave up the dead that were in it. And so they, the, the scriptures in the New Testament talk about that uh, when a young girl had died, it says Jesus told them she is only sleeping. So there's, I don't want to get into the teaching of soul sleep versus the teaching of the separation of the soul and spirit from the body. But the easiest verse to uh, allude to this is where the Apostle Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And in the Old Testament, it said Abraham gave up the ghost. Now, ghost is a 1611 King James word. The Hebrew word there would be Abraham gave up his spirit and was gathered unto his fathers. The gathering unto the fathers in the Old Testament didn't just mean uh, to be buried in a cemetery because where Abraham was buried is the caves of Machpelah uh, in Hebron. And he was uh, buried there with Sarah. And of course, uh, uh, some of the other patriarchs are buried there. The matriarchs are buried there. So there was not a graveyard with people before Abraham and Sarah buried in that cave. And so someone said, well, to be buried, to be gathered to the fathers simply means that you go to the cemetery and the soul and spirit sleeps there. It does not mean that. Luke 16 tells of a story of a rich man who died and a beggar also who died. And they were, the rich man went to hell. And by the way, this is not a parable. This is actually a true story, I should say. And that in hell, the rich man lifted up his eyes being in torment. And he sees the beggar in Abraham's bosom. Now, if Abraham's soul and spirit is still in the grave, if it's still in the physical body, how can Abraham be carrying on a conversation in the heart of the earth, in a chamber underneath the earth with a rich man who has died and whose spirit and soul is in hell and a beggar who has died. And it says the angel carried the beggar into Abraham's bosom. And once again, that's not a parable. I was in a debate with a man that was a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, I was in an 11-week revival and the only place to eat in La Follette, Tennessee was McDonald's. So I was at McDonald's 11 weeks every night and it's the only place to eat. And this young man was there and he would debate me on hell. All he wanted to do was debate on hell. And he kept saying, Luke 16 is a parable. Luke 16 is a parable. Luke 16 is a, it's like a robot. You know, Luke 16 is a parable. It's not a parable. It is a story that happened. Now, my point is, it's very clear from scripture. And I'm just, I'm abbreviating this actually. I'm really abbreviating what I could tell you from scripture on this because of the sake of time for the program that 
at the moment of death, a righteous person's soul and spirit is carried by angels now, not under the earth, and that's where we're going to go in a moment, but to the third heaven, to a place called paradise, which is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. But when you die, your soul and spirit come out of your body. Now, why am I telling you this? All right. Now, before I read the verse, we go to the crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus, uh, the Bible tells you at the third hour, he's crucified. At the ninth hour, he begins to make his final statements. And then when Jesus died, the Bible said this, that he gave up the ghost. Now, again, if you read the 1611 Bible, it'll say ghost, and that's an old English word, but the translation in Greek is he gave up his spirit. And how do we know that? Because he said on the cross, Father, into thy hands I commend or I hand over my spirit. Now, here's a question. Where did the spirit of Jesus go the moment that it was taken out of his body? Now, some scholars say, well, of course, it went to heaven where it stayed with the Lord and then it came back to earth. It did not. Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm going to give you some other verses here in a moment. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. Now watch that. He led captivity captive. What does that mean? And gave gifts unto men. And of course, after he led captivity captive, the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and gifts were distributed to the church, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, nine gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. Now that he ascended, meaning present tense, now he is in heaven, what is it but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fulfill all things. And then he talks about the gifts given to the church, Ephesians 4, 11, the fivefold ministry for the perfecting of the saints. Ladies and gentlemen, pay careful attention because I want to show you something that's in Scripture. Jesus said, as Jonah was three days and nights in the belly of the fish... So the Son of Man must be three days and nights in the heart of the earth. Now, I challenge you to do something. I'm not going to preach all of this because this would be all the message and I would forget to tell you what I want to tell you. If you will go study very carefully the story of Jonah, Jonah actually was thrown off of the boat and we assume by our preaching we've heard that a great fish, which would have been a whale, swallowed him and he was alive in the belly of the whale for three days. That is not what happened. The reason the great fish swallowed him, if you will read in the book of Jonah, he describes he went down to the sea. The sea it's, in the, it's in the book of Jonah. The seaweeds were wrapped around his head. And as his soul was fainting within his body, he remembered the Lord and began to cry out. Then he says, out of the belly of hell I cried. And it says, and the Lord and Jonah prayed to the Lord out of the fish's belly. See, we've heard preaching sometimes, and that's why it's very important to study the Bible, break the verses down. This is what, how many of you love it when Perry Stone breaks the verses down? Isn't it? Really, you know what I'm saying? Because when you break the verses down, this is when you get the nuggets from the Bible. So the point is, and this is real heavy what I'm about to tell you, but we've taught this before. We've written about this and so on. Jonah actually drowned. God brought a fish to preserve his body in the fish. Three days and nights, he was in the lower parts of the earth. He disobeyed God and he's praying. And God allows him to resurrect and the fish vomits him out. And I believe the reason the fish vomits him out, we know a whale can swallow big things. But as Jonah comes back to life in that fish's belly, it would be like you having a belly ache. Are you with me? See, he's dead. He's in the body. The, the, the fish can't eat him and consume him. Now, can you imagine the Ninevites were a lot of them up in that area, knew the Mediterranean were fishermen. And I, was, I read from a scholar that some of them worship, worshiped a great fish. So if those guys are fishing, imagine this. And all of a sudden, this, this whale comes up. Oh, I'll look, look, and they're all gathering. And then a man rolls out of there. And, he's, you know, his body's got to be bleached from the acid. And the guy's, the guy's saying, repent. He's like, yes, sir. Oh, God. 
I mean, you got it, man. I, and so it, it, was a, it, was, it was a long journey to Nineveh, but he made it in a day. Because <laughs> it's real funny. What, it's real strange what will happen to you when you go to come to hell and back. You know, when you've been to hell and back, you, you, hey, you, your life gets changed sometimes, all right? Now, Jesus compared his death and resurrection to Jonah being in the belly of the fish. And then we read in the book of Ephesians, again, where he descended into the lower parts of the earth. Now, if I go, because, I, because if I go into the details of all the scripture, I'm going to run out of time. So this is what I've got to show you. Before the resurrection of Jesus, men and women who were righteous went to the lower parts of the earth and there were chambers there. There was Tartarus, and that's a Greek word for hell. That's in 2 Peter 2 and 4. Fallen angels that didn't keep their first position that fell with Satan. God eventually took num uh, uh, large numbers of them and bound them in uh, hell. Now, the Greek word hell in 2 Peter is Tartarus. So there's angels that are bound in Tartarus. That's a chamber, according to the Greeks, under the earth. There's Sheol, there's Hades, there's uh, the, uh, one, one Greek word for hell in the New Testament is Gehenna. I don't have time to preach on that, but that's actually the name of this valley, the Valley of Hinnom, which, uh, where Judas hung himself in, above the trees there in that valley. Before Jesus was crucified, all righteous people went into a chamber underneath the earth. Now, when I say they went... Their body went into a tomb and their soul and spirit went into this lower chamber. One of the things that Jesus did that no one preaches about is at his resurrection, well, I say no one, let me, I shouldn't say that. Most people don't understand this. I should say I haven't heard it taught that Matthew says that when Jesus raised from the dead, they were seen walking the streets, many of the saints which had slept. Where did they come from? They didn't come from heaven. He, their soul and spirit, our soul and spirit now after, after the crucifixion, I should say resurrection of Jesus, our soul and spirit at death is taken out of our body into paradise in 2 Corinthians 12. Before that was opened, do you remember when Jesus said, I go prepare a place for you? That's what he's talking about because he said, in my father's house are many mansions. The mansions were already built. Hello, there's another tradition we got. Are yeah. yeah. is present tense. He's not up there with a gold hammer and nails. I hate to just mess up all your Southern gospel songs, but he's not up there with hammer and nails and it took God six days to build creation, but he's been working on my mansion for 2,000 years. No, he has not. The new Jerusalem existed in Abraham's day because it says Abraham looked for a city that hath foundation whose builder and maker is God. So the new Jerusalem's been there and, the, and, and what we call the abiding places have been there. When Jesus said, I go prepare a place for you, and I wish I could have time to do all the Greek word studies for the word place and show you this. That was a place in heaven where when we pass this life, we don't go down anymore. We go up. Yes. See, we don't go to the bowels of the earth now since he raised from the dead. So here's what I'm saying. Jesus went to the lower parts of the earth to where the righteous compartment was. This would have been Abraham, this, that man Lazarus in the story of Luke 16, Isaac, Jacob, the sons of Jacob. They're all there. Now, Oh, I wish I had time to preach this. Every now and then, someone down there would get word of what was happening up here. How do I know that? Well, Moses and Elijah showed up at the Mount of Transfiguration and told Jesus about his death. How they know that? Hello. How, are you are all with me? They, they, they talked to him about his death. Now, every now and then, someone would say, you're not going to believe. I just died, and there's some guy in Jerusalem named Jesus, man, and he's healing the sick like all over the place. Really? Hey, this could be the one. And then as the people would die and begin to tell their stories, because how many of you know the Bible says in Luke 16 and other places, you have memory, your soul and spirit has memory when it's out of your body. So they know what's going on on the earth. Well, they, they got a trip. Mm -hmm. Somebody better help me preach now. They got a trip one day from a man named Lazarus from Bethany. And this man Lazarus from Bethany happened to be a good friend of this man named Jesus from Nazareth. So they said, where you come from? He said, man, I'm telling you, there's a man named Jesus. He's been in my house. My sisters know him. He's, they have fed him, and he is the Messiah. He's telling us he's the Son of God. He's telling us he's the one that we've been waiting for. And everybody gathers together, and Isaiah says, i got to tell you about him. He's going to be a, like a lamb brought to the slaughter. And David said, let me tell you about him. They're going to have to pierce his hands, and they're going to have to pierce his feet. And another prophet steps up and starts talking about him. And Lazarus says, tell us what he's done. Well, 
I was with him on the Sea of Galilee, and they tell me he can walk on water. Somebody came to me and said, 2,000 demons uh, went in out of a man and into the pigs. And somebody said, that's why I heard a bunch of squealing in hell. I knew something was going on. I knew something was going on. I heard some squealing down in hell. But I'm telling you, all of a sudden, after a period of time, Lazarus is preaching, and he says, Lord, it just sounds like I can hear him now. My, in fact, I think I hear him calling my name. Bam! Lazarus' spirit is lifted out of the paradise, back to earth, back into his body. And I'm telling you, I believe all of heaven came down in, in the gates of hell, and the righteous began to shout and said, it's getting time, it's getting time. But one day, the earth began to shake. One day, Jerusalem began to quake. Uh, one day, the spirit of Jesus descended into the heart of the earth. Uh, and I want to tell you, there was something called Satan that didn't know the plan. There was something called Beelzebub, who's the prince of darkness. Uh, there's, the, there's, a, there's a spirit called death and a spirit called hell. On the first day, Satan said, do you still have him down there? And they said, we still got him down there. He ain't going nowhere. On the second day, Satan came and said, give me a report from down in the bowels of the earth in Abraham's bosom. Is he still down there? And they said, you better believe it. He's still down there. On the third day, oh, Lord, on the third day, the earth began to shake and began to quake. And Satan said, hey, can somebody give me a report? And somebody said, mm, oh, death comes up and hell comes up and said, you ain't going to believe what happened early this morning said, we had him bound down here. He was up there preaching. They were all hooping and hollering. But said, all of a sudden, we heard somebody walking toward the gate. Somebody walking toward the gate. We never heard these footprints before. We never heard these footsteps before. And said, I said, said the prince of darkness, the gates of hell, the owner of the gates of hell, said to this, who are you? And the man said, my name is Victory, and I'm coming for Jesus. And, and old, old death and hell, the spirit of death and hell, because they are spirits, said to Satan, you're not going to believe what happened earlier this morning. He's emptied out the place. The upper compartment is completely gone. And Satan said, oh, my, I've got a headache now. I thought I got rid of him, and now where are they going? And he took those, you know what he did? He took those righteous souls to paradise. And then Jesus goes up on the Mount of Olives. He ascends back to heaven, and the devil thinks it's all over with. But then he starts noticing that these disciples are meeting right up here in a room. He says, you better keep an eye on them because there's something going to happen and I don't know what it is. But it was on the day of Pentecost at 9 o'clock in the morning when they were all gathered together in one mind and one accord. And suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind filled all the house where they were seated. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit. I know, look, this is my message. I'll preach it like I want to, okay, if you don't mind. For you theologians that are watching, this is just how I feel like telling it. And all of a sudden, Satan, Ephesians 2 and 2, is the prince of the power of the year who's had his eye on Jerusalem, starts looking, and Mary comes jumping out, Peter comes rolling out, Thomas comes running out. He said, what on earth is going on? And he says, uh, some, somebody says, well, we got real problems now. Why do you think we got problems now? He said, because the Spirit of Almighty, the same anointing that was on Jesus, the same power that cast out devils, the same authority that healed the sick, you thought you got rid of him. Now you got 120 acting just like him. We are in trouble now. And before the day was over, there was 3,120. And before the month was over, there was 8,120. So I've come by to announce to the Heavenly Father, the Holy Angels, the Kingdom of Darkness, uh, that they estimate somewhere in the world now, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 600 million Holy Spirit baptized, tongue talking, fire baptized, Jesus loving people. And it started out with 120 right somewhere in this area. And guess what? We got 380 of them sitting here in the... Yeah. Excuse me while I take a praise break. Hallelujah. You say, well, y'all are getting awful excited. Brother, we're not, we are not talking about a funeral. We didn't, we're, we're going to the garden tomb, and the difference between our Messiah and everybody else's is you can go to the graveyard and, and visit the boneyard of every other Messiah that's ever lived. Do you understand you from other religions? Your leader is dead and in a grave rotting. I'm in Jerusalem, and when I walk into that tomb, it's going to have a sign up that says, ain't nobody home. Come on in. He is not here, but he is risen. Glory, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Woo! Ah, Lord, I'm getting so happy. They may run me out of this place, but I'll finish this message before they do. 
Jesus Christ came out of the grave, brought the saints of the Old Testament with him. That's leading captivity captive. Took him into the third heaven. And now when we pass, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we don't have to go down into that bow of the earth the way they did for 4,000 years because he prepared a place for us with the Father in heaven. Ooh. And so there's a lot more information on this subject because there's a lot of mysteries and this is one of them. And so when Jesus stood in the book of Revelation and said to John, I'm he that was dead, but I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and of hell. That's how he got them. And so keys means authority. Now, if you have ever accepted the Lord as Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have what's called eternal life, but you have to abide in Him. You have to continually follow Him. You have to serve Him and do, do what the Scripture says to do. And if you've never had a relationship with the Lord, we're not talking about religion. We're not talking about religious ritual. We're talking about a one-on-one, -on -one, I pray, I seek God, I love God relationship. You can have it right where you are. You don't even have to go to a church to repent, believe it or not. You, can, you do that right in your heart between you and the Lord. So I want to encourage you, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, to have that relationship because He alone is Savior. That means the Savior of your soul, giving you eternal life, and He is also Lord. And so uh, we have an offer, as you know. This is what keeps manifest on the air throughout the year, and it'll bless you. It will really bless you. So watch this offer right now. And Please watch the end of the program where I'm going to be coming to because we got a lot of new places we're coming to we've never been to before. All right, folks, I'm out of breath. Somebody better help me preach right here now. Somebody better, somebody better help me preach. We have been advertising our Old Testament commentary, the 500,000 word commentary that's part of a King James Bible that now thousands of you have because of popular demand. Many people have said, well, you continue to offer it. I want to be able to get it. I haven't been able to, but I want to be able to. So we're going to continue for the next few weeks to offer the Perry Stone Hebraic Prophetic Old Testament Commentary. That's right. This is full of explaining Bible prophecy from the book of Daniel, from the book of Isaiah, from the book of Jeremiah, from the book of Zechariah. It is filled with Hebraic notes and research. It's Hebrew word studies. In the book of Daniel, we do special word studies to help you understand what's going to happen in the future. In Isaiah, in depth, that's right, in depth, meaning at the end of the book of Isaiah, we have an in depth to explain something special, a special passage or verse in the book of Isaiah. It says, the Dead Sea, the possible location of the future lake of fire. I'm going to show you from the book of Isaiah some very strange predictions and prophecies, and I'm going to relate them to the lowest spot on earth, which is the Dead Sea. Many of you have never heard that, but you're going to get it by reading the commentary that I have written in this Old Testament commentary. Now, it's a 1611 King James Bible with 500,000 word commentary, and I'm proud to say printed in the United States of America. You can call 1-888-21-BREAD and order that way, or you can order online at perrystone.org or send a donation of $160 or more, because we do need your help to stay on television to keep the Manifest program going, and write Perry Stone P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee 37320. It comes in a beautiful box, but most of all, you're going to glean from information that it took me years and years and years and tens of thousands of hours to put together, and I want to make it available to you. This is my legacy that if the Lord should come or uh, I should go to heaven, I want to leave with you the Old Testament and New Testament commentary, and this is the Old Testament commentary made available right now. So please, order it today. Limited supplies, not available in any bookstore anywhere. God bless you. If I could start my ministry over again, one of the things I would love to have is someone who could mentor me in the things of God. When I was a kid, the Dakes Bible was one of the main Bibles, and I literally devoured that, the information that was in it. And I wanted to have something that people could put in their hand, in their home, on a consistent basis to study the Word. That's why we have the uh, Prophetic Hebraic Study Bible. and. You, I also have a New Testament edition, 280,000 word commentary. You can get those together by contacting our office, Voice of Evangelism. 
Thank you so much for your time of uh, sharing with us on the Manifest Telecast. The final place that we're going to before I leave on my Israel trip for this year is going to be Summers, Somerville, West Virginia, November 8th through the 10th. That's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday morning. And that's in Somerville, West Virginia. And we're gonna be meeting at the New Life Christian Academy Gymnasium. So join us for that. Normally in the month of November, uh, we go to Israel. We stay over there about 20 days. And that's where a lot of the manifest programs that you see are taped while we're there. But uh, you can't tape outdoors if it's raining. And so please pray for us that the weather will be great for the manifest taping. And don't forget, two Warrior Fests coming up in the spring, the Prophetic Summit, the biggest meeting of the year, the end of April, toward the end of April. And also Sioux Falls at the end of May and Montana at the end of July. We're going to be coming to uh, the uh, First Nations camp meeting, the Navajo camp meeting. It's the, the Pentecostal camp meeting down in um, New Mexico. So the best thing to do is to go to perrystone.org and look up the itinerary and go down that itinerary, see if we're going to be coming into your area anytime soon. We've been sharing with you the past couple of weeks the significance and the importance of this gospel going into the nations of the world. Um, the longer I do this, the longer that I minister, the more that I, that I realize that the our time is only set for a certain period of time, both our time of living and our time to do the work of God. And I am a person that is driven by vision, by the vision and the assignments that the Lord has put in my heart. You know, our next assignment is, is this youth camp that we're working on and then a, a 90 day mentoring school, which we're talking about a year and a half away, at least by the time it's all done. But there's always something it seems that the Lord is putting in my heart to do. I believe that there's things that God has called individuals to do, but they rejected it and they turned it down or they were fearful or maybe they said, Lord, I don't have the income to do it. And so they, they did not do what God called them to do. But the Bible says, let no man take your crown. I believe it's possible that someone could take your crown that you would have received if you're not doing the thing that the Lord called you to do and someone else stepped in to do it. I, I don't see how ministers, for example, who say they're called to preach could leave the ministry and just work a secular job. I know there's been circumstances that have come up in ministers' lives that were very negative and it kind of left them in a bind where they didn't know what to do. But I don't know who I'm talking to right now. Don't leave the call of God for secular work just because you had a moral failure or because that something bad happened or Christians you know, shafted you or disappointed you because there's a whole world out there who needs the messages of the Word of God. Jesus said that the harvest is plenty, but the labors are few. And this is the reason why we have an internet Bible school, ISO.org, an internet Bible school. This is the reason why we're building the buildings, why we're having the conferences, why we're traveling across the United States at age 60, still preaching the gospel everywhere we can, is because I'm trying to reach as many people that we can while we can, while daylight is still burning. And so I wanna also mention to those of you who keep up with Manifest that are partners of our ministry, to thank each and every one of you, whether you're on our monthly manor or whether you're partner Strike Force, because without you, we could not keep the program on the air around the world. And uh, our resource material goes 100% back in the ministry. I don't get royalties or get paid for, you know, for what we offer because it's all going back to Voice of Evangelism Ministries. And I want you to know that as well. Thank you and God bless you. We'll see you next week on Manifest.